Morning, everybody. I want to talk through an important update from the College and the Difficult Airway Society following a recent death related to unrecognised esophageal intubation. Now, any of us that have been in the game long enough will have accidentally intubated the esophagus, recognised the misplaced tube and recited it correctly in the trachea and continued on. Esophageal intubation per se isn't a problem, but of course, failing to recognise it is universally fatal. So I want to briefly rely, yeah. uh, remind yeah. you of this tragic case with information from the public domain to the best of my knowledge and um, briefly discuss the incidents of esophageal intubation before discussing the college's response to the incident, which is the latest in many deaths over the years, sadly. So Glenda Logsdale, who many of you will have heard about, um, was a retired radiographer who presented for an emergency appendicectomy. A consultant pre-op and airway assessment had been performed and she was allocated to an emergency list with a consultant covering the emergency theatre. Now, perhaps unusually, certainly for our practice in Nottingham, pre-oxygenation and the initial intubation attempt, which was a rapid sequence induction, were delegated to the ODP by a consultant. Now, that attempt at laryngoscopy and intubation failed and the consultant took over um, intubating the patient. Now, following intubation, the entitled CO2 was noted to be below one kilopascal. But the consultant recalls being able to manually ventilate, then secured the ET tube and attached the ventilator to the patient. The saturation continued to fall down to 85% and the consultant made a diagnosis of anaphylaxis to rocuronium, continued to manage it. No. Uh, two trainee anaesthetists who were passing heard the low sats noise on the machine and attended to offer assistance and inquired as to the uh, placement of the endotracheal tube. And the anaesthetizing consultant reassured them that it was a grade one laryngoscopy. The saturations unfortunately continued to fall and the emergency bell in that theatre was pulled. And five minutes after the uh, uh, induction, cardiac arrest ensued and CPR commenced. An additional senior help arrived. Um, and that was a consultant who was asked to uh, go and get help from ITU. The anaesthetizing consultant informed everyone several times during the management of this uh, anaphylaxis that the intubation was easy and that the problem was most certainly anaphylaxis. When the uh, consultant colleague returned from ITU, having uh, got some assistance, they then checked the endotracheal tube and discovered it was in the esophagus. This was identified some 15 minutes post induction and very sadly, uh, uh, Mrs. Logsdale died some days later from hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Now, a review of the event revealed a number of problems, both human factors, equipment and knowledge failures. And the coroner came up with a number of very interesting observations here that there was an, a contagious fixation error that the problem was uh, anaphylaxis, an infectious certainty uh, uh, pervaded in the anaesthetic room uh, with the consultant very confident that this was anaphylaxis with no other problem and indeed dismissing some of the, uh, the um, suggestions to check the tube. And indeed the term an inhibitory hierarchy was mentioned. And some poor teamwork and confusion, features that we've heard before in many of these sorts of events. And uh, other human factors and heuristic failures, such as uh, confirmation biases, availability and anchoring biases, are also at play in our, our decision making in these stressful situations. Perhaps unusually in this, in, in, in this trust compared to our trust, an end tidal carbon dioxide waveform was not a standardised feature on these monitors. Indeed, one had to press a series of buttons to get the uh, capnography waveform, although the number was was present. Um, during this situation on the ventilator, one of the uh, attending anaesthetists confused the ventilator pressure waveform for the capnograph waveform. And the coroner also made the observation that uh, the bed in the anaesthetic room made for a very crowded environment. And it became apparent during the coronial investigation that there was a bit of a failure to understand uh, physiology and that the college's previous no trace wrong place um, program and, and publicity uh, was uh, not familiar to the anaesthetist looking after the patient, nor to the uh, anaesthetist who performed the uh, SUI review.
So sadly, the immediate absence of capnography in this case was assumed to be anaphylaxis uh, rather than uh, an, an esophageal in intubation. So this went to the coroner's court and uh, a PFD was uh, raised after this, which is a report to prevent future deaths. And the coroner gave a narrative verdict concluding that uh, Mrs Logsdale's death was wholly avoidable and was contributed to in a major part by neglect. And this really has given our profession a challenge. And the coroner laid down a challenge to the college the hospital trust and to us anaesthetists all over to avoid unrecognised esophageal intubation. But uh, how common is this? Well, since NAP5, uh, NAP4, sorry, there's been a number of other cases. And in fact, uh, at this very meeting, John Hardman has related one of these to us previously, where he's been involved from a medico-legal perspective. Now, NAP4 looked at uh, airway morbidity and mortality and found that there were nine cases of unrecognised esophageal intubation, which was uh, uh, some 5% of all airway-related mortality. So there were three cases in anaesthesia, which led to two deaths and one severe brain injury, uh, four cases in ITU and two in ED, both of which were fatal. So how common is esophageal intubation in our practice, though? So looking at some fairly large studies, um, the uh, Hoytnik's uh, audit tool, where they looked at uh, gave questionnaires to anaesthetists over an eight-week period and examined some over two and a half thousand anaesthetics, identified an incidence of esophageal intubation of some 3%. Now, of course, this is esophageal intubation that was recognised and then managed, not an unrecognised esophageal intubation, as, as we've just been talking about. So some 3% of uh, cases in this series uh, involve an esophageal intubation. And in Peterson's before and after airway strategy study, uh, she identified between one and, uh, uh, well, about 1% incidence of uh, esophageal intubation. So risk factors for esophageal intubation. So in the big three of the ASA claims, closed claims analysis of airway morbidity and mortality, inadequate oxygenation, esophageal intubation and difficult intubation accounted for some 60% of morbidity and mortality. In the ASA series, esophageal intubation is often recognised late from cardiovascular changes, with lung auscultation being felt to be unreliable. Internationally, of course, there's varied availability of capnography versus in the UK, whereas the college and the association have campaigned very strongly over, over the last decade or so to strongly mandate it. But this is an interesting graph here. So this is a 10-year analysis of some 10,000 emergency intubations in a single centre performed by Mort. And he noticed that um, multiple attempts at intubation were associated with significant increase in problems. As the complexity of the airway management increases, so did the incidence of, uh, of problems. With if it took more than two attempts to intubate the patient, then esophageal intubation had a six times higher incidence. And indeed, some 54% of patients in this series who required more than two attempts at laryngoscopy ended up with a tube transiently in the wrong orifice. If we apply this to NUH, where we intubate in excess of 21,000 patients a year, and we think of an incidence between one and 3%, it would seem that we'd have between two and 600 uh, esophageal intubations, which of course are uh, fortunately recognized, captured and corrected. So given that esophageal intubation seems to be almost a fact of life, how can we improve and how can we respond to try to prevent these tragic unrecognised cases from occurring in the future? Well, the college has responded with local, national, human factor suggestions and technology suggestions. And one of the things that uh, the college is keen to happen uh, on a national basis is that the college, DAS and FICOM are working together to publicise the no trace, wrong place. Uh, campaign, which I'll mention a little more in a moment. There's going to be sessions at the winter scientific meetings and the SALG meetings going forward on the esophageal intubation. The college is, of course, supporting the association's uh, monitoring standards, which uh, really do emphasise the importance of capnography at all stages of airway management. Uh, and of course, it's part of the AXA monitoring. On a local uh, front, 
the uh, college is keen that the no trace wrong place is, is highlighted in the IAC, communicated broadly across trusts and discussed at governance days and morbidity and mortality meetings, and that there should be a move to consider VL and of course, uh, capnography within a trust should be standardised. Um, from a human factors point of view, the college is keen to see uh, human factors training, and that is part of the AXA standard at the moment. And uh, the college has also put together some uh, flashcards for uh, quick training and recap talk through type training to occur during briefings, which we'll talk about in a few moments time. And then from a technological point of view, the college is going to work with Barima, who are the uh, technology and monitoring and equipment uh, agencies to standardise the display. So the capnography appears in the same place on uh, the anaesthetic monitor and ventilator displays in the same colour with the same form of taxonomy. And there's even some suggestion about smart monitors to support decision making, where one may see a, uh, rem an audible reminder on the monitor that esophageal intubation is a possibility in situations where there's an increase in pre and cyclical increase in pressure being applied by a ventilator, but no capnography. There's an audible and visible warning of potential esophageal intubation could be displayed by monitors in the future. So a reminder of the college's capnography no trace wrong place campaign. Now you may and I well I hope you're familiar with this uh, and have seen Tim Cook's video uh, which is about seven and a half minutes which was initially targeted around uh, intubation during cardiac arrest which highlighted the point that even during a cardiac arrest and even actually after death that uh, a positive waveform capnograph will be um, dem demonstrable in a patient uh, who has a intubated trachea and if there is no demonstrable capnograph then esophageal intubation must be actively excluded. So from my own experience here's a uh, uh, some telemetry of a patient who has very sadly at the point of this red line suffered a cardiac arrest and we can see that the CO2 does fall but with CPR ongoing we can see a capnograph trace on the trend diagram here. So a capnograph will always be present in a patient undergoing CPR. And indeed, there are studies that show that even in uh, unpreserved cadavers in the first hours and even up to a day after uh, death, that there is uh, waveform capnography present if a patient does have an intubated trachea. So the message is, if there is a flat trace, that the tube is in the wrong place. There are, of course, many other causes of a flatter trace, but the one that kills rapidly is esophageal intubation. And we must assume esophageal intubation until proven otherwise. And it may be valuable to ask a colleague to verify tube placement or record on the Glidescope VL system that we have. The actions to take with a flat uh, catnograph trace would be to remove the tube and in most circumstances to reintubate or oxygenate through a face mask or laryngeal mask airway and ventilate by other means and where necessary exclude a block tube or circuit which of course will produce a very um, firm bag and significant difficulty in ventilating uh, if there is mechanical obstruction. Now it's worth thinking about how we teach capnography uh, down in, uh, in Bath because they are posh. They talk about hats and caps for their capnography teaching and publish this, uh, these pictures in a letter they wrote to anaesthesia uh, in teaching uh, trainees about capnogra capnography whilst on the ITU. And the very simple message is that these nice uh, repeated waveform top hats, they would call them, um, indicate successful intubation of the trachea and a normal looking capnograph and perhaps a little bit of an upslope if there's a, a small bit of bronchospasm, but certainly a flat trace is very bad. So no hats in Bath are very bad, but this is a nice simple visual reminder. Some practice points for us to take forward then are about the importance of uh, video laryngoscopy and I'll come on to that in just a moment. We'll talk about language and human factors and then I'll briefly show you the Royal College flashcards which we'll be distributing uh, in the next day or so. So 
Video laryngoscopy reduces esophageal intubations, and there's Cochrane level data to support that, which I'll show you in a moment. Reduces the difficulty of intubation, which again I'll show, and improves the quality of view, which of course is unarguable. It enhances teamwork and team training, enables multiple viewers at intubation, but is only of value to those who, train, who are trained to use it. Now, just to give you a little bit of good news, I've got another 15 Glidescope core systems arriving in the Trust this week, which means that we will have the largest deployment of Glidescope core systems in Europe, uh, with some 58 Glidescope systems across the Trust. So if you're working in an area where it's a, a battle to get a Glidescope, then do let me know as we have another tranche of systems to deploy very shortly. There's a forthcoming Cochrane review, um, which hasn't been published yet, but I've managed to get these uh, images for it, which have again, uh, as happens every five years, reanalyzed the data around video laryngoscopy. Now, anything to this side of the uh, line of unity would indicate uh, a preference for video laryngoscopy and uh, anything to this side would uh, favour direct laryngoscopy. And in the context of failed intubation, we can see that the uh, uh, plots are all to the left, which fa favours video laryngoscopy. So there is some evidence now that uh, video laryngoscopy in trained hands reduces uh, failed intubation. Now, of course, this is an experienced intubators. There's no change in the incidence of hypoxemia or mortality, but very few studies reported those very rare outcomes. Video laryngoscopy reduced airway trauma, hoarseness, and the number of difficult views uh, in experienced hands, but not for novice uh, VL intubators. As with everything, practice makes perfect. And really, with the number of systems we have around, we really should all be practicing regularly. So we are perfect in case we do uh, have to manage a more challenging intubation. There's no evidence that video laryngoscopy reduces the number of intubation attempts or the time to intubate the trachea with the present level of information that we have, but certainly it reduces the incidence of failed intubation. And in the context of esophageal intubation, again, we see a um, clear indication that video laryngoscopy reduces the incidence with all systems. So just a, an example, video laryngoscopy is an excellent educational tool, and I'd like to show you this clip here where I was working with uh, another anaesthetist, and um, it was obvious to me that the trachea had not been intubated, that this was an esophageal intubation, but the uh, anaesthetist I was working with hadn't noticed this. So I was able to ask them to repeat laryngoscopy and identify the position of their uh, endotracheal tube. And the tube was removed and the trachea was successfully intubated and position corrected and the case proceeded uneventfully. But this is a valuable and hopefully positive teachable moment. And of course, because I, the ODP and the intubating anaesthetist could all see the screen, there were three sets of eyes that visualised uh, that endotracheal tube. And of course, it was uh, obvious uh, to myself and the ODP that that was not in the right place. Thinking about human factors. Airway management is teamwork and warrants a skilled and trained team and uh, in hospital training of airway teams is encouraged and Tim Cook made a point in one of the recent presentations around this case that this may soon be mandated. Now I haven't heard anything else from the college about mandating uh, airway team training but that would seem to be something absolutely fantastic and we'd strongly support that uh, here in Nottingham. I'd like to briefly mention language. Now, one of the things that's bothered me over the far past few years are perhaps some of these falsely reassuring statements that are used around the time of passage of the endotracheal tube. You'll recall sometimes when you're working with uh, one of our, uh, our ODPs that during a, a rapid sequence induction, you'll hear them say, that's it, I felt the tube go in, I felt it go, the tube pass, I'm sure that's in. And that, of course, is perhaps an unhelpful statement. Uh, the chances of correctly identifying a misplaced tube are some 60%, uh, i.e. 40% of uh, esophageal intubations would be missed by palpation of the, uh, of the trachea. And signs like tube misting and chest rising, whilst only helpful if positive, um, only helpful if negative, um, aren't accurate enough to replace capnography. So I do worry a little about those sorts of, of, uh, of phrases, uh, but they are a helpful uh, learning opportunity to remind people to the value of capnography uh, trumping every other uh, indicator that we have. 
And uh, given that we've got uh, uh, Nick Levy on the call, I just draw attention to uh, a nice letter he wrote in Anesthesia about a series of statements that one can one can uh, make during uh, intubation and laryngoscopy, uh, positive confirmations of uh, endotracheal intubation. And I quite like the idea of saying positive capnography to indicate that the uh, waveform capnograph is um, a top hat. I pre perhaps prefer saying repeated positive capnography because one can be caught out in these rare cases of esophageal intubation where a carbonated drink has been uh, administered and there are case reports in the literature where there has been waveform capnography present for uh, three or four uh, waves prior to uh, uh, it dissipating. But I think I like these very binary statements, uh, which are very similar to those used during critical phases of aviation, such as positive rate of climb gear up that our pilots might use. And I think it would be well worth us considering using a positive and clear demonstrable statement and agreed with our ODP colleagues. So you might have seen a difficult airway society uh, on Twitter have published a, a number of these uh, single page reminders and I'll circulate these on their Janu airway system. So we now have uh, uh, one page reminders about the risks of esophageal intubation and capnography and I'll circulate those to our uh, team leaders and uh, ODP staff. The college has produced, well, recognising that time for um, in situ simulation is, is challenging at the moment. They've produced these uh, flashcards which describe a series of scenarios that take about five minutes. And the idea is, is that we uh, run through these very uh, quick scenarios in five minutes during our briefings. I'll circulate these across the department and to the training team and team leaders. Uh, we're going to do one this afternoon in ENT to see how it works. So in summary, unrecognized esophageal intubation is avoidable uh, with waveform capnography. It's always fatal unless rapidly detected. It's previously been a never event up until 2018 and may soon be reintroduced again. Correct interpretation of waveform capnography is the primary tool for detecting it. And uh, remember that no trace equals wrong place and to actively exclude esophageal intubation before thinking about other problems such as bronchospasm and uh, anaphylaxis. Training of the whole airway team and empowerment of the airway team to uh, uh, raise problems and feel free to speak up is essential to safety. And factors involved in reducing the risk include video laryngoscopy training, good monitoring practices, standardis standardisation of our capnographs and uh, safety culture. The college has set this page up now um, following this latest PFD report from the coroner and uh, there's a link there if you scan the uh, QR code at the bottom which will take you to this and a series of videos around the uh, situation including the latest SALAG meeting uh, which David Bogod chaired. So look in your inboxes for some further information and resources and I'll be sharing information about this with our theatre teams as well. Thanks very much. Thank you.